Hello friends, my name is Winston Pratt and I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Peace Church in Richmond, BC. We are so glad that you have decided to join us for worship today. And the prayer of our hearts is that you will be blessed by our time together and that you will also experience a special touch of the Lord's grace in your heart today. So friends, summer is upon us and so unfortunately is COVID-19. But what I want us to do is I want us to bathe in the warmth of God's grace this holiday season, even as we are forced, you and I, to reimagine summer in the light of the pandemic. So we'll take a break today from talking about COVID-19. Let's not allow the pandemic to have the last word before the holidays begin. So I'm glad that you are joining us today. We are beginning a new series for the summer called When Heroes Fall. So my question for you is, have you noticed that the Bible presents its heroes, warts and all? So the Bible's timeline runs for around 1,500 years, and over that stretch it presents us with many heroes to look at and to emulate. Yet it does not hide their moral lapses or their character flaws. For my part, I am glad that it does so. It reminds us that you and I, that we are fallen creatures and in need of God's mercy and God's grace. Just imagine a book of spiritual guidance that only presented lofty ideals. That would be inspiring on the one hand, but also terribly deflating on the other. Who would measure up? Who could live like that in every area of life all the time? So, as we study these heroes, we see that the life of faith does not always match that lofty ideal. But we also see that God knows this too, and that God in His wisdom and grace has devised a pathway for growing and maturing our faith over time. So why the series? Well, unfortunately, many believers never fully experience the joy of being totally forgiven. Instead, they often live lives feeling defeated by sin, full of regret, and a sense of having failed. In fact, friends, that may be you today. You may feel like you have let God down terribly. You know that God has forgiven you in your head, but somehow that message hasn't quite dropped down from your head to your heart. There's nothing that the devil delights in more than dredging up our past. And there's very good reason for that. It's easy pickings. It's low-hanging fruit. We have all done things that we are ashamed of, even as believers. And our accuser loves bringing these things up time and time again, and saying, see, what about that? Yep, God may have forgiven you, but has He forgotten? Are you sure that He can pass over that slip and set you back on track again? That might just be one step too far for God. And this was my own experience when I first came to Christ in my mid-teens. I had grown up in a Christian home. I was taught the gospel from a very, very early age. But whenever I failed after my conversion, I felt this need to recommit my life to Christ over and over again. And so this is what I did for quite a while, each time with more fervor and intensity than before. It took a couple of years for me to grasp and to feel what totally being forgiven means. What I needed was to grow and mature in my understanding of the life of faith. So what does that mean? It meant for me that I had to reform my vision of faith to one that was true to life, but also sympathetic to our struggles. It meant that I had to reform my vision of grace to one that is hopeful and uplifting, especially when I messed up. But it also meant that I had to form a better vision of God that reveals God's true nature as gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love and mercy. So, what is the pathway of growth and maturity that God has laid out for us? Well, first it begins with recognizing a false expectation. 
the expectation that faith is a straight, continuous, upward line of progress. We move from one great experience of God to the next with no interruption in between. And in tandem with this, faith grows from strength to strength with absolutely no setbacks over time. Now, it is a great ideal, but it's not realistic. Nor is it the path of growth that the Lord has set out for us. And second, it is being honest about the reality of faith as we experience it. So what I want you to do is to indulge me for a moment. Let me use an analogy from the world of business. We discover from the Bible's trajectory of faith that faith looks more like a stock market curve. It's this journey of ups and downs. It's a path marked by victory and then failure, but then bouncing back again. But in the end, over time, we can look back and see an upward trend. So for today, I want us to explore this question. How does faith grow? What picture does the Bible offer to help us understand the process of maturing spiritually over time? And so who better to study than our heroes of the faith? From their experience, this is what I see, but I want you to check to see if this is true for you. So it starts with a deep personal encounter with God. Now this experience differs from person to person, but it is real and it is profound and it touches our lives in a truly meaningful way. This encounter then is followed by a heartfelt response of faith by us and obedience to God's initiative and love. We feel really alive in our spirits and we feel unshakable in our faith. We are on a high. We are fully committed and we believe that nothing can deter us. We are confident that we will stay this course. Except, friends, God knows us better than we know ourselves. What we see from our heroes is that at some point they will encounter a test. Yes, God allows us to be tested. As James reminds us, you will be tested, but testing produces perseverance so that you may become mature and complete, lacking nothing that you need. So here's the reality. Sometimes we pass the test and grow in grace and faith, and that is a good thing. God is glad. But sometimes we fail the test and a weakness is exposed. And that's not good, and God is disappointed, but God still has a plan. God is not setting us up for failure. No, my friends, that is the devil's intention. Satan's goal is to destroy our faith, to leave you and I feeling weak and defeated, and also beyond redemption. God, though, wants to bring the flow into the open, to reveal it so that we can deal with it, so that our faith is strengthened and our character is refined. God's purpose is to build us up, not to break us down. So, for today, our first hero is Abraham, the proverbial father of the faith. So let's see if we observe this pattern in his life. So, here's his story. Abraham and Sarah are pagan idol worshippers living in a faraway land. One day out of the blue, God calls and sends him to a distant land. God also makes him an astounding series of promises. God will give him a family of his own, despite his wife being barren and the two of them being advanced in age. God will turn this family into a great nation one day. God also promises to give him a land of his own, and God will provide for him and protect him wherever he goes. And God makes him, or God will make him an incredible source of blessing to the entire world. If you look at it, it's the stuff Hollywood movies are made of. Yet Abraham trusts this unfamiliar God and heads off. And he builds small altars of worship in the new land once he arrives. Great response, Abraham. Heartfelt obedience and genuine worship. 10 out of 10. A perfect model of faith. 
Aha! Then comes the test. There is a famine in this new land, and they must go down to Egypt in order to survive. Except there's a problem. Abraham knows how these ancient kings operate. When they see a beautiful woman, they take her into their harem. And if they know that she is married, well, then they just get rid of the husband. Problem solved. So, fearing for his own life, he asks Sarah to lie and to say that she is his sister. This despite the fact that God had promised to protect them. He is unsure that the power of God reaches all the way down to Egypt and to Pharaoh. And so he concocts a lying scheme to save his own skin. Father Abraham fails test one miserably. His life being on the line, friends, has exposed his narrow view of God's power, but also his pagan thinking, that the gods were territorial and that their power was restricted to their domain. It also exposed an underlying impulse in his heart to protect himself at any cost. Abraham needed to see that God was sovereign and that God's power was unrivaled and extended everywhere and that God could protect him wherever he went, even in a foreign land. So, God struck Pharaoh and his household with a series of plagues. And somehow, we don't know how, they discerned that it was because of Sarah. And so Pharaoh confronts him with his lie and promptly gives Sarah back to him and then tells him to scram, basically to get out of Egypt quickly. Imagine that, friends, the father of faith selling his wife short to save his own skin. He gets rebuked by Pharaoh, and rightfully so, but he and Sarah are safe. It turns out God could get through to Pharaoh in Egypt too. Now, friends, we need to think about ourselves. How often we think and behave in a similar way. We encounter a problem that seems totally insurmountable. And then we begin to doubt God's ability to help us, and we start to take matters into our own hands. We plot and we scheme and we make rash decision, decisions with really, really bad consequences. Testing exposes these flaws in our character and our faith. So, Abraham failed his first big test. That, in a sense, should have disqualified him right there and then. But it did not. God had not given up on Abram, even though he had let go of God for a while. So, friends, it's easy for us to read this story and just to write Abram off as a weakling who lacked courage. But the Bible does not let us reach such a simple conclusion. Abraham was a mix of faith and of doubt and of courage and of fear, and sometime later we see that God appears to Abraham again. This time, God shows him the full extent of the land that he will receive, and God sends him on a reconnaissance mission. God tells him to walk through the length and the breadth of the land to scope it out. And Abraham does so in obedience to God's command, and he builds another altar to worship God. Great response again, Father Abraham. Ten out of ten. Then comes the test. His nephew Lot, who is with him, is captured by invading kings. How will Abraham respond this time? Well, we see that he musters up a small army and he sets off to rescue Lot. He pursues them hard and he launches a very skillful attack, successfully recovering everyone and everything that was captured. So we see that Abraham is no weakling or innate coward. Here he trusts God to be with him and also to grant him success. So, he passes test number two. Things are improving. He is making progress on this journey of faith. But we see that this will be the pattern of his life over and over again. Up and down, up and down. In fact, friends, he fails terribly on at least two more occasions. 
he and Sarah take matters into their own hands to produce an heir through their slave Hagar. The heir is his son, but not her child. That's not God's plan. And we discover that he palms Sarah off as his sister again with the same result. She is taken into the harem of another king, and God threatens this king and returns her to Abram. And again, this foreign king rebukes him for his duplicity and scheming. Abraham goes back to begin to learn that first lesson over again. We see that our hero's example is a checkered one, a mixed bag, if you would put it that way. But thankfully for Abraham, he passes his greatest test later with flying colors, honoring God, and he is held up as a hero for it. So, brothers and sisters and friends, let's pause here for a moment to take this in. What do we see? What about Abram's example fills us with a better vision of faith? One that is true to life, but also one that is sympathetic to our struggles. One that is hopeful, especially when you and I, when we have messed up terribly. But also one that reveals the truth about who God is and especially what God is like. So firstly, we see that the life of faith is a journey of growth over time. Our spiritual walk is filled with ups and downs, and it is often this mixed bag of success and of failure. Yet despite our fluctuating performance, God does not give up on us. With God, friends, there are always second chances. In fact, from Abram's life, we see that there are second and third chances, a whole lot more chances than you and I deserve. So this may be a word for you today from God. Just because you have messed up doesn't mean that it is over. If God could work with Abraham, God can work with you. What matters more to God is that you stay the course and not give up. When we hold on to God through our fears and through our failures, we grow and we mature over time. That faith line, yes, it may oscillate, but thankfully, the trend by God's grace is upward. Abraham grew into the hero that he would become over time by testing, but also over time by God's patience and grace in dealing with him. But secondly, we see that testing is not a constant pressure. The Bible stories follow closely on each other, and sometimes when you're reading them, this can give you the impression of a relentless onslaught of one test after another. This is one's lot in life. But this is not the case. We discover that these tests are occasional, and for Abram they occur over at least three to four decades. There were long periods in between when life continued as normal. And I want us to keep that in mind, that God is gracious and knows how much we can bear. And then thirdly, friends, thankfully we see that God is looking for faith, not for perfection. For hearts that are responsive to Him and for people who admit that they are weak and in need of grace. And this is the fertile soil in which faith can grow. Friends, with God the pressure is not unyielding nor is the pace unrelenting. God takes us where we are at, and God works with us at the speed of our hearts and our minds, at the speed that we can bear, not too fast, but not too slow, just right for each and every single one of us. But fourthly, we also saw that failure does not disqualify you. Oh, friends, I want you to hear that failure is not the end. Abraham messed up royally on at least three occasions. And it is so easy for us to see failure as the end, as the defining feature of our life story. But failure does not automatically disqualify us from still being used by God. It may close certain doors for sure. For example, if you committed fraud, 
you probably won't be allowed to work in the financial sector again. But friends, that does not mean it's the end of your usefulness to God. Learn from the past and ask God to open new opportunities into the future for you. Don't let failure stop you moving forward with God. Giving up lets the devil win, my friends. Moving forward in grace, ha, ah, that gives God the glory. So fifthly, and most importantly, remember who God is. Know God's heart. So let me close with the words of King David from Psalm 103, verses 8 to 14. These verses are the foundation upon which this series is built. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will He harbor His anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His love for those who fear Him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. As the Father has compassion on His children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. For He knows how we are formed, and He remembers that we are dust. Friends, God knows that we are but dust. But thankfully, like a great potter, He has chosen to work with the mud and the dust that He has made. Oh, my friends, may you and I bathe in the glory of God's grace this summer. Let me close in prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your mercy and your love and your grace. Thank you for your patience with us and that with you there are always second chances. Thank you that you forgive and restore us when we fall. Lord Jesus, fill us with a better vision of grace and faith that is true to life in this world and true to the reality of your resurrection life and power at work in us by your Holy Spirit. Help us to grow in faith so that we lead fulfilling lives according to your purposes and plan. And Lord, may all the glory go to you, we pray in your name. Amen.